Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Physics Chat. Physics Chat, as you know, is a show where we talk to physicists about their work and about their experiences, which is very useful to us, but also hopefully a bit useful to, to some of you. I am here with Molly and Joe. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah good, ready for you. a new episode? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you better be because uh, today we have a very, very special guest. Daniela, no how are you? <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so Daniela will tell us all about her research uh, in a minute. But before we get started, there are two announcements that I want to make. First one, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that we've had to fire Susanna from Physics Chat. <laughs> and this is because uh, of conflicts with our previous guests. <laughs> um, so it's a serious issue and that's why I'm putting my serious voice. But it's also a joke, so don't believe me, <laughs> and you'll see Susanna in the next episode. And the second point um, is that so far in physics chat, we've only had PhD students. And most of you know what a PhD is, but for those of you who don't, a PhD is the highest um, academic degree one can get, which involves putting out there some new science that was previously not known. And, and that makes it very exciting and interesting. Um, but Daniela here, our guest, is not a PhD student. So my first question to you, Daniela, is what comes after a PhD and what is the position that you currently hold? Okay, thank you, Sergio. Right, so typically after a PhD, um, you do one or more, usually more, uh, fixed term research positions where you well you essentially act as a more or less independent researcher that depends on the specifics and you either carry out your own independent research program or you participate in a research program uh, where the boss is someone else but you do your own independent bit so these are called either fellowships or postdoc so um, I'm lucky to have quite a lot of freedom, essentially, because my boss is really nice. <laughs> so I'm a postdoc at the SCG. I've got really a lot of freedom. Essentially, I yeah, do pretty much what I want, which is great. Uh, this is not always the case. In any case, you typically do one or more of these fixed term research positions until a small percentage of us actually gets what's known as the holy grail or a permanent research position but yeah that's a small minority and uh, that's also called the unicorn and yeah, <laughs> all these sorts of things oh, so thank you for explaining that to us um and i think we all hope you end up being a unicorn with a permanent <laughs> position at some point <laughs> so what uh what big open question at the moment in physics interests you the most right it's whether there are any new fundamental forces that we don't know of what does this even mean Okay, so just completely coincidentally, I happen to have an apple here, right? Uh, so as you know, it's a symbol of gravity because the legend goes that it fell on top of Isaac Newton, which most likely didn't. But for practical purposes, it's going to be useful to imagine it did. So I have an apple, I drop it, it falls. Why? So as we know, this is because of gravity. Right, so gravity is a fundamental force of nature. It's the kind of thing that makes stuff drop, okay? But here's the thing. Let's imagine we can zoom over this apple, zoom a lot, a lot, like lots of times. Well, if we do, then we're going to discover that the apple is not a single homogeneous object. It's actually made up of stuff. It's made up of small stuff. And in particular, it's made up of molecules and atoms. So what keeps together these atoms and molecules, because in principle, these gazillion of things, they could just disintegrate. Well, it turns out that it's electromagnetism. It's the same force that powers your electric lights, that powers the laptop I'm using, most of the, of the you know, electric appliances we use in everyday life, if you're in the rich world. Um, so yeah, electromagnetism keeps the atoms and molecules of the apple together, okay? So we've got the second fundamental force. Now, here's the thing, even the atom is made up of stuff, even the atom is a composite. So let's zoom over the atom. And it turns out we've got a positive atomic nucleus surrounded by electrons. And the nucleus is kept together by yet another fundamental force. It's called the strong nuclear force. 
And there's more, we have a fourth fundamental force because uh, three is good and four is the charm. And the fourth fundamental force is the weak nuclear force that is behind things like the decay of atomic nuclei. So um, yeah, radioactive decay of nuclei, for instance, is powered by the uh, weak nuclear force. So we've got four and everything we know in the universe is powered by these four things, okay? Good. The question is, is it it? Or are there more things that we don't know of? So is it perhaps that like we didn't know about the nuclear forces, now there's something else we don't know? And uh, by the way, I'm not working on this alone. It's a huge effort worldwide. I'm one of many people working on this. And we're trying to figure out whether there's any more fundamental force that we don't know of. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that was a really good explanation for, <laughs> um, for why we might need this extra force. Um, I guess the other key question is, so, I mean, you've mentioned the four fundamental forces, but then this mysterious fifth force, how do we even go about like testing for this? How do we go about finding this fifth force? Great. And like I coincidentally had an apple, I think Sergi coincidentally has some video. Okay. So in this video that Sergi kindly is showing, you can see a structure forming in the universe out of particles of matter coming together, essentially. Okay. So uh, dust, especially in the universe coming together and forming structure. So the point is, as you see the structure form and the structure collapse, the question is, does it collapse under gravity or under gravity plus something else? And this is where you can actually see whether there is something else, whether there is an extra force. Because if it's just gravity, we know how gravity behaves. If it's gravity plus something else, or if it doesn't look like just gravity, this is where you can start investigate and see whether there is an extra force. So in summary, we see it from the way stuff comes together in the universe. Brilliant. So that video that we just watched, where did we get that footage from? I assume we didn't film it ourselves. So these are simulations of, it's called structure formation in the universe. So basically you take a supercomputer, you try to replicate the conditions as we think were in the early universe and switch on gravity and let it do its job. So the, the way we simulate the early universe is because we are lucky to be able to see something called the cosmic microwave background, which is the oldest light that there is. It allows you to see the universe almost 14 billion years ago. And so from this slide, we can learn a lot about how the early universe looked like, what it was like. So then you start from something that looks like that and then just let it do under gravity. OK, so you switch on gravity and do. <laughs> and then you, 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 you check a bit later. I mean, in the real universe, it will be billions of years later. But fortunately, the supercomputer is like minutes or hours or in the worst case scenarios, days later. And you go back and check uh, what's happening. So in this... The video you just show, you just showed uh, is a result of a simulation. Uh, okay, see, thank you. Yeah, it's quite cool, right? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is amazing that we can uh, we can simulate and try and figure these things out. And what you're working on at the moment with this extra force um, just sounds so interesting. I'm sure you've had so many amazing moments throughout your you know journey through academia. Is there any particular highlight or any particular moment that you're particularly proud of that you could share with us? Yeah, uh, so I will not share my biggest achievement, but I will share something that I recall really well. So it start of my second year of PhD, so I was a PhD student at UCL, it's late in the evening, and there, was, there had been something had been failing at for at least a month, if not more, maybe more than a month. And I had been just, you know, banging my head against this wall that was never coming down, until suddenly it was working i couldn't believe it so i think by that point it was 10 p.m and i had to celebrate like i really thought it was not going to happen so i did the important things like the victory dance yes i have a victory dance and then i had to celebrate somehow so fortunately close to my home right, that at the time was in tutimbak comma london there was a franco manca pizzeria in balam comma london so i called franco manca and i tried to ask if i can order a pizza but tragedy I was 12 kilometers away. It was going to take some time before I could get to the pizzeria. And so maybe it was not, I mean, it was going to close down. But from the accent of the person on the other side of the phone, I can hear that she was Italian like me. I'm half Italian, half Syrian. And so I knew I could speak openly. And I said, look, 
I thought I was never going to be able to do something. I did it. <laughs> I, I, I had to celebrate. Would it be possible for me to be a bit late? <laughs> and she understood. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I understand. I will keep your pizza. So to the unknown waitress in Franco Manca, um, in Balam, in, I think, uh, well, whenever that was, thank you for keeping my pizza. I really appreciate it. That was one of the best pizzas of my life. I was able to celebrate the first time the coat didn't fail. In, uh, I don't even know how long, frankly. But yeah, no, I, I remember. And I remember thinking that victory tastes like strawberry. Yeah, maybe, maybe she's watching the video right now. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk about something else I know you're passionate about, um, and that is um, improving diversity in science. Could you just tell us a bit about um, where your passion maybe comes from and also things that you think are needed in the scientific community to improve diversity? Okay, uh, so let me start by explaining why this is not about charity. This is not like being charitable to those uh, pitiful minorities in science. Um, the point is, uh, talent is equally spread among the human community, but opportunity is not. Now, let's imagine we've got 100 people in the room and 10 of these people are really good at science, whatever this means, and I'm going to put an asterisk there. Now, of these 10 people, let's imagine that we live in a world, this world, in fact, where, okay, let's start, we exclude most of the black people. So. Among these 10 people, some are black. You just exclude them, like, to start with. Uh, then we exclude most of the women. Okay, so let's get rid of, like, at least two-thirds of the women. Who needs them anyway? Uh, then you get rid of the poor. I mean, who needs the poor? And then you get rid of those who have some disability, which doesn't interfere with science, but you don't care. Let's just get rid of them. And then you start getting rid of people until maybe you're left with just one of these initial 10 people. And maybe this person is not necessarily the best, but it's one that's sufficiently rich, sufficiently white, sufficiently male, of one of the dominant ethnic groups in any country, you know. So characteristics that are not really uh, related to science because you don't want the widest and the malest and the richest, you want good scientists. So how do you go about having good scientists? Well, essentially you go about your criterion being picking the good people at science. So instead of picking the richest, the whitest, the malest, let's just make it about science. And currently it's not. Currently there are people who don't have access to this in practice. It's like uh, you've got people in line, you know, waiting for something, waiting for their turn, but some people are preventing from standing in line. So the importance uh, to so to clarify then the importance of ensuring equal opportunities in science is not an act of charity towards the women or the ethnic minorities or whatever it's an act of making sure that those getting the positions in science are the actually good ones so this is the first thing so and this also you know gets to why it's important so in my opinion also why it's important is it's because it's a decent thing to do but because you know it's not necessarily thought of as important by everyone. Uh, if you want a good scientist, you need to have equal access to opportunities, okay? So this is the first thing. Um, talent is equally spread in the human family, but opportunity is not. Now, let's go to what could improve. Uh, so currently, academia is both very diverse and not at all. It's diverse in terms of nationality. So you have people working together that sometimes are from countries that are at war with each other. So this is good. You've got people from you know, different corners of the globe. This is good. But it's very homogeneous in terms of um, race. You know, uh, race are not equally represented. Women are still a minority in many fields. And by the way, this is not because, uh, to give an idea, apparently, Women are good at mathematics, but not theoretical physics, which are basically the same job. So exactly how this happens is unclear to me, because if you do the same task under different names, it shouldn't matter, right? But yeah, this is a stereotype. Oh, by the way, just in some parts of the globe, because in other parts, it's the opposite. Anyway, so there are some arbitrary criteria that essentially prevent some people from participating in science fully, okay? Now, even if you look at the representation of the scientists in the media, it's always uh, an old white 
guy in a lab coat. It's even always the same lab coat. It makes you wonder if at least wash the lab coat. Well, in fact, the, the people who work in science are not like that. I mean, even look at the four people in this call, right? Uh, we're not like that. Um, so something I would like to say in the off chance that it's useful to at least one person who is listening, if you are a young person considering doing science and you don't look like an old white guy in a lab coat, the same unlaundered lab coat, uh, and you like this, and you like science and are willing to work hard, please don't think that you can't do this because you're not an old guy in a lab coat, okay? And by this, I also mean recognize the stereotype that's likely to be in you, okay? It takes two people. It takes the society to decide that only some people are good at science, but it also takes someone to believe it. So the, uh, you also need to recognize the stereotypes you may be holding towards yourself and others as well, to recognize them and try to act against them for the entire community, for yourself, for decency, for, you know, for a number of reasons. Yeah, that was amazing. It's really good to see the passion you have. And I certainly hope we're able to get passion from other people. Wow, thank you very much, Daniela, for all your wisdom that you shared with us today. Um, but before you go, I want to get a bit more of that wisdom. So there is a final question that I want to ask, to ask you. And that is, what, what do you think makes a great scientist or physicist today? Okay, hard work. Number one, hard work. Um, you know, again, the, <laughs> the, the image again on the media is that the scientist is this mysterious person that works alone and has these great ideas out of nowhere and, and that's it. So basically it's about... Um, having this idea. So you either are or aren't a scientist. Well, the truth is that the most important thing between, behind science is hard work and failing for a sufficient number of times. Um, so I remember once I was 16, I got fixated onto a physical problem. I think it took me three weeks of failing um, before I got it. And I'm not ashamed. It was a very difficult problem. You know, it, it takes failing. Every useful, interesting enough research project involves at least 90% of failing. So the if you try to do something at physics or at science and you fail, that's completely fine. Just do it again and then again and then again until you do it. You know, it's, it's mostly about hard work and failing and failing again, and then ultimately succeeding some of the times. It's really not about uh, being a different breed of human being. It's about working hard first and foremost. Very true, very true. What about you, Molly and Joe? I completely agree with Daniela. I think another thing that I really look for in um, scientists is anyone who can um, explain their work to like general audiences, you know, and, you know inspiring uh, a younger generation of of scientists and yeah being able to do it in a really accessible way that's understandable for everyone which Daniela has done very well for us today so thank, thank you what do you have to say to I am the guest <laughs> <laughs> yeah I guess I would say someone who isn't going to be like ashamed or scared admitting that they don't know something or they're wrong it's kind of like you know if you as soon as you admit that you don't know something you can go to someone and get help and make sure that you do it faster rather than just being stuck on something for ages and getting nowhere because you're too scared to, to admit to anyone you don't know what you're doing. Very interesting. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's physics chat. Thank you, Daniela, for being our first postdoc here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, a pleasure. Molly, Joe and myself will be back for another physics chat very soon. But in the meantime, please let us know in the comments what you think makes a great modern scientist and keep writing in the comments. Um, from everyone at Field of View, uh, we hope you had a very good day and see you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> it's really not about uh, being a different breed of human being. It's about working hard. Mm, thank you. That's really good. Oh, sorry. I've got another photo bomber. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you see everyone want to say hello? <laughs> hello. Well, you can't see me, but yeah, I'm sorry. Here. Yeah. This is Lucia. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, we're recording. Yeah, among other things, Lucia works on artificial intelligence. <laughs> and the Euclid, yeah, sorry. Yeah, more photobombing. Yeah, sorry, Lucia, we're recording. Sorry, guys, I wasn't anticipating this. My fault. That's okay. Another future guest for Physics Chat. We will put it in the editing. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs>